Lazy summer afternoons had taken hold of my new suburban homestead, and the first fruits of harvest were coming in. As I showed previously, my once threatened tomato plant had flipped the script to turn into a poster child for tomato success and resiliency. Yep, there's some beautiful large tomatoes. Some are ripe, some are turning ripe. I'm gonna harvest them because I know if I just let them here, there's a chance that an animal like the groundhog will eat the ripening tomatoes. And they usually don't even eat it all. They just take a bite and leave it. So might as well take it and let it finish ripening the ones that are not ripe yet. Inside, close to a sunnier sill, that's the perfect place to put them. But I'm really happy to see the plant as vigorous as it is. There are, there are still um, blooms happening. There, there's fruit that's still setting. And I don't see that many signs of disease yet. It's still a bit early. It is uh, middle of July, which means that there is the potential for wilts to really make the, the whole plant just completely die overnight. But I'm keeping hopeful and I think I'm gonna have a lot of beautiful tomatoes to come. Their size is just amazing. One sobering fact is that whatever your environment is, it's gonna really affect how much production you get out of your garden. I hadn't realized how important sun exposure, I mean, I already, always knew, but just by seeing how much growth I'm getting in this new place compared to my last one, it's almost like, why did I bother grow in the last one? Not that I couldn't get decent harvests, I could, but I've done much less here. I've planted much less here, but I've gotten so much more already. And everything looks more vibrant, more beautiful, healthier, and maybe, I don't know, maybe tastier. We'll find out. But it saddens me that there's a lot of land that could potentially produce m many vegetables and they're being used for lawns currently in the suburbs and they have perfect sun exposure. I've struggled with my last place trying to eke out as many vegetables from about six hours of direct sun at the most in only in a few spots. But here with the true southern exposure, even with buildings around it, it's a game changer. I can't stress that it enough. If you are a beginner gardener and you feel like you're failing, maybe you're failing because of the place. It just plays so much of a role. Both sun exposure and also obviously water availability and then I would say soil fertility. I seem to have everything here. I do have a bit of shade from the houses as I said, but it's not enough to really hamper my efforts as much as it did in the last place. And even in the last place, I just planted a lot and I still produce a lot. So it's possible, but it's just much more encouraging when you have the perfect conditions. So if you're ever gonna try to find a home where you wanna settle, try to find one with Southern exposures. Try to find one that has a reliable rainfall pattern or um, water source that you could irrigate if you want to grow vegetables successfully. Working with anything less than that is doable and it should be done. But the rewards are just so much bigger. This really puts into perspective how critical it is to have decent solar exposure in your garden in order to be successful with fruit producing crops such as tomatoes. Not only are hours of direct sun exposure important, the aspect of the land is also vital. My last garden was situated on the north facing side of a valley, so that meant that I was at a disadvantage when it came to the angle of sun hitting the land. A slope facing north in the northern hemisphere will take longer to warm, receive comparatively less sun, and have a slightly shorter growing season than a south facing slope. This was a fact that people a hundred years ago really valued, and you can notice that many old settlements and farms 
take advantage of the south-facing aspect of the land to use to position their homes and gardens. I'll be back right after this commercial. As July gave way to August, summer heat arrived in full to ripen the tomatoes. Fortunately, temperatures were closer to the lower 90 instead of in the triple digit range. The tomato vines formed castles of green over the rustic twig scaffolding. They were happy with their moderate heat and plenty of rainfall. By adding weekly helpings of grass clippings to their feet, they had the perfect condition of moist fertile soil to anchor their roots onto. Even the tomato vine that I had planted later and had struggled to grow showed so much vigor now that it was hard to remember its initial struggle. It had produced delicious red globe with the sweetest taste. This was grown from seed I had saved from the wild crossing of an heirloom brandy wine and a Galapagos cherry tomato some years ago. This tomato here is really something. And it appears that this plant here is not showing as much of the splitting and it has a lot of acidity but at the same time sweetness and savory it's it's almost like i'm eating a tomato with salt but there is no salt it's crazy i love it now this for sure is going to be a plant i'm going to save seed from especially if i see that it doesn't split as much it's kind of pale in color compared to your typical tomato which and it has the pinkish um tone which makes me believe this must be must have some of the brandy wine genes mm. plant doesn't produce as much and it has the typical thin um, stems that are characteristic of the Galapagos tomato I planted it still produces it's just not abundantly but it's a lot well for cherries, it's good. It's not like the ones that bear about a hundred fruit in one cluster. But, you know, can't complain. That's a keeper. I just saw something exciting. There is a tomato hornworm, but usually when you see them, you want to take them out. But this one, I'm going to let it be there for a specific reason. That tomato hornworm is infected by a parasitic wasp that lays eggs on top of its back or in its back actually it's kind of gruesome um, the larva will grow and eat the hornworm from the insides the reason why you don't want to take it out once you see that is because you want the wasps around to control the tomato hornworm and by allowing that one to live while um, the larva grows you'll have more of those wasps in this environment so it makes sense to leave that one and it will probably take care of everything else I've never in my years of gardening had too much issue with tomato hornworm this year there were some tomatoes that were eaten and I suspected it was that but um, by allowing these wasps to proliferate in this place and most likely as I put in more flowering plants and other things that could um, give more habitat for the beneficial insect hopefully it's not going to be an issue here either it is the first year usually you see more pest pressures in the first year because it's a new place you haven't built the biological um, ecosystem or community to handle threats like that but ultimately it's about a balance you can't exterminate all pests you'll always have a little bit the, the, the key, the wisdom is in controlling them in a way that you have, you're able to eat and you're able to, to provide a, a space of diversity where all life can grow. These tomato plants were a true success. Who would have thought that the spindly plants planted a bit later than ideal would create such biomass by the close of summer? I had not expected they would have grown so large. They even had swallowed some of the basil plants planted around them in the process. They also showed almost no sign of disease. While a few insects like the tomato hornworm and aphids had appeared here and there, they didn't last long and did not pose any risk to the plant. 
there was no major yellowing or leaf drop and that meant I would probably have tomatoes all the way to the first frost in October or November. Never had I experienced such a beautiful specimen. You will see what happens to them as the season closes in my next episode. See you then. Você está feliz?